Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to Behind the Mic. I'm Jonathan Hodson, back with you again for another chat th this evening with another great sportscaster. We have another exciting show lined up for you tonight. We're joined by accomplished veteran sportscaster Claude Fay. Claude, Claude Fay. Claude has been... Uh, in sportscasting for about 25 years, a large portion of that with TSN and CTV. He's been on the broadcast team for major moments and events in different sports and leagues, including the NBA, the CFL, CIS, U Sports, and many others. Along the way, he's interviewed several legendary athletes and icons across different sports. So we'll talk for sure about those encounters and we'll also get into Claude's chapter in instructing in college media and radio courses and what he has to say as far as wisdom goes for the next group of aspiring sportscasters. And on our final block tonight we're joined by my colleague here from ASTV, John Eastope who hosts the Double Digit Hockey Show here on ASTV. We'll get into a little bit of the Western Hockey League, which is in the process of starting up. And then we'll talk to him a little bit about Double Digit Hockey, some of the fun interviews he's already had, and what he has on deck. So we're going to take one more break here, and we'll be back on the other side with Claude Fagg. And back again here on Behind the Mic on ASTV Productions. Jonathan Hodson back with you. Joined now for our first interview this evening with veteran sportscaster Claude Fake. Claude, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it, Jonathan. Thank you very much. This was uh, something that we've had in the works for quite a while. I know I first reached out to you a little, little while ago when... Uh, this uh, project was first in the plan, so we're mm -hmm. certainly glad that it uh, finally came together and excited to, to visit with you and get some of your stories and some of your wisdom. No, absolutely. And uh, I know you guys are based out west in uh, Vancouver. And, uh, you know, I have a couple of memories about BC. Uh, I haven't, haven't spent a lot of time in Vancouver proper but uh, three things that jumped out to me. Uh, first off, when I was in my college days playing basketball, uh, we went to Kamloops from uh, our college here in Toronto at Seneca College. We played in a tournament in Kamloops, had a lot of fun there. Uh, of course, 2010, the Olympics in Vancouver, I was part of the coverage back here in Toronto at uh, CTV News Channel. I anchored uh, and showed a lot of highlights and spoke to a lot of people at the venues in BC. And six years ago, I can't believe it's been six years, I was in Prince George for the Canada Winter Games with TSN. And uh, that again, three weeks there, but it was uh, a lot of fun. And so a lot of fond memories about BC. And, um, you know, it's just one of the, you know, beautiful, beautiful spot, one of the greatest spots in Canada. So uh, always happy to touch base, and I still know some people who work out there, so uh, always happy to touch base with the West Coast. Much easier winter, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks like it, although you guys got a bit of snow there, uh, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we've had our snow in the east has been certainly less than what it should be, and so there have been times where it's been, like today was six degrees, at the beginning of March, and it looked like a spring day, and tomorrow we may get back to snow. So it's Canada. It's still winter. I don't think anybody should be shocked that we get snow in Canada in March. Yeah, absolutely. But as well, I'll talk to John about here uh, at the 
the last block of the show this year, uh, the start of junior hockey season kind of mm. signals the start of spring this year, <laughs> which is kind of strange with the WHL um, doing a kind of a shotgun start uh, with their different locations getting approvals. Uh, but we'll get into that with John a little bit later on. Uh, what I wanted to do with you uh, yep. Claude is I wanted to kind of kind of very quickly uh, we we'd be here all day if we if we did a deep dive on everything um, but uh, I wanted to kind of give the give the the audience a little bit of background mm -hmm. uh, before we get into things um, about kind of kind of um, your upbringing and kind of what got you into sports and and sure. what turned you on to sports casting. Well, first of all, um, I, I've always, I've loved sports uh, since I can remember as a little kid playing. And I, I grew up in South America. So I grew up in Venezuela, which is not the Venezuela that is currently uh, in place, but uh, it was a much nicer place to live. Uh, and so I played a lot of soccer and baseball, which were, you know, two of the biggest sports down there. And so I always had a love for sports and my mom was in the acting business in Venezuela. She was a model, she was an actress. And so she would take me to set quite a bit. Uh, and so I got exposure early on about being around cameras and lights and set, you know, the whole, the whole deal. And I probably knew when I was 10 years old that this is what I wanted to do for a living because I love sports and I loved television and the broadcast side of things. Now, again, I'm only 10 at the time and we had just moved to Canada. And so there weren't a lot of TV channels to watch. There wasn't a lot of things you could flip around like you do now and watch whatever you wanted when you wanted. But my exposure early on was hockey, of course, being in Canada. And of course, one of the biggest, one of the first things I was exposed to was the Summit Series in 1972. And boy, wasn't that exciting. And not only that, our teachers in our grade school brought televisions into our classroom so we could watch the games. Like that's how big a deal this was, right? Wow. But then, you know, beyond that, you're watching the games, you're listening to Foster Hewitt, the legendary Foster Hewitt calling the games. And then beyond that, once that series was over, you start watching Leaf games. And no matter what you thought about the Leafs, and this was only, what, this would have been, uh, four or five years after they won their last cup in 67, uh, you start listening to Ron Hewitt and uh, and some other people calling games and Bill Hewitt. There's There were three Hewitts. And so Bill Hewitt, Ron Hewitt. So I started watching that and I started trying to mimic the play-by-play -play guys doing their thing. And my English wasn't great when I was 10. I was still learning the language. I was still trying to catch up. Uh, but my mom's got a cassette somewhere with me trying to do play-by-play -play watching a game on television. I think that's when I definitely knew in my heart, again, I'm only a kid, but as I went through the years, I, I can pinpoint that particular time to say that's when I first realized that this is something I would love to pursue. Of course, the big question was, would I be able to do it? Would I be able to go to school for it? Would it be something my parents uh, approved of, right? We all want to make our parents happy. And so there was that aspect. And so I knew that this is what I wanted to do. I went to school first for some other stuff. I tried business. I tried, you know, computer programming when that was a big deal. Uh, but I knew in my heart this is what I want to do. So I flipped over and I jumped onto the uh, TV and radio production course here in Toronto at Seneca College, and it kind of kind of went from there. It took a little while for me to get my legs in the business full time, but I did a lot of different things, which, by the way, anybody who's aspiring to be in broadcast, no matter what form this is going to take now, obviously the digital world is here, like this show that we're doing right now, but you try to get as much experience in as many different ways as possible, and back then it meant volunteering at the local access cable station in Toronto. And I did a lot of stuff with them, a lot of play-by-play, -play, a lot of reporting, a lot of different things that got my feet wet some more. Uh, I My first gig in broadcast was behind the scenes here in Toronto. I was a highlight editor. I was a writer, producer, 
So I did all that stuff. It took me a few years before I could get a real big break in front of the camera, in front of the mic. But I look back on all that with fondness because it made me a better broadcaster, I believe, by the time I got my real chance to start doing this. And I had that experience behind me. And so uh, anybody who's aspiring to do the same, and I tell my students the same thing, the more things that you can get your hands on right now, and no matter what the form is, again, because this is an ever-changing uh, world of broadcast, the fact is it's still going to benefit you down the line. And so you want to be ready when you get that chance. And I want to back you up for one quick moment because there is something that caught me um, about your, your upbringing. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. your mom uh, being an actress. And mm -hmm. this is something that we've talked on the show uh, to Rod Peterson about before, um, about sportscasting, even in mm -hmm. settings like this, being a form of performing. And oh, I, from, that, no from that, I wonder, did you pick up anything from your mom in her line of work uh, that taught you about being an on-air performer? I don't know if I picked up anything. I know, first of all, I did a couple of commercials when I was a kid, so I was actually exposed to the being in front of the camera thing. I didn't have a lot of lines, so I didn't have to worry about that because they were just commercials. I wasn't a kid actor by any means. I didn't do any of that stuff. But what it did, I think, is it gave me a, a comfort level being around cameras and seeing when productions, uh, you know, I used to go, I also used to go to shows here in Toronto in the, I want to say in the 70s. It's ironic, I ended up working at the same building that I used to go to as a kid and watch them produce shows, like Canadian game shows that were being done here in Toronto. Uh, definition, headline, headline hunters. I saw these things. I used to go to a few, I, I went a few times. I was so passionate about the broadcast element. So it wasn't necessarily because it was sports, because it wasn't sports, but it was production and it was television. And I just loved seeing how they put it all together, and all, all the work that went into it. And it's just ironic that, you know, a couple of decades later, I was back in that building as a full-time sports reporter and actually talking to a couple of the people who would have been working back then on those game shows and telling them those stories. And they were just blown away because uh, that gave me a lot of confidence and just a lot of comfort to be able to walk into the same, basically the same studios and do my sports casting on a, on a night, uh, on a daily and a nightly basis. So when you did get your chance uh, to get in front of the camera, mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the, what were some of your early goals? Where did you, where did you envision taking this thing when you first uh, got your shot? Well, understanding that there was no digital era back then, you basically had three options, right? You could be in front of a camera and do television. You could be in front of a microphone and do radio or you could be a journalist and be a newspaper uh, reporter of some kind, you know, newspaper, magazine. I knew I wasn't fit and qualified to be a great writer. There are some excellent writers even to today. I mean, but writing is a very uh, underrated craft in my mind. But the, the television side was something I always aspired to. And really my goal initially when I got the job as a sportscaster was, okay, I wanna be an anchor for my entire career. I wanna be a reporter, but I, I wanna be an anchor. So that was very common with a lot of people who got into it. If you became a reporter, the next step was usually to become an, an anchor. And so I got a chance to do both and I enjoyed it. But then I realized there were probably other things I would also like to try. And one of them was anything with a live event element. So any games. So being, a, I became a sideline reporter for CFL games for 12 years. I enjoyed that immensely. So I would cover games here in Toronto and also in Hamilton. I enjoyed it so much because first of all, it's, it's a game. You're at a game. You're getting to cover a game. But I also like the fact that you were right there in the trenches with the players where you can hear them, you know, beak each other and, you know, just like you're right on top of the play, basically, especially 
in Hamilton at the old Iverwind Stadium where the two teams were literally side by side. Um, and then that opened up other opportunities. You mentioned off the top in your intro that I did some MBA. And so at that time, in uh, I want to go back to 2003, TSN was doing some of the Raptor games on their own. It was TSN, CTV, uh, sort of combination. Uh, and so I got a chance to be the uh, courtside reporter for a handful of Raptor games that year. They didn't have a lot, but it was still exciting because I love basketball. Basketball is my sport. It always has been. And um, so I got a chance to do that. The Raptors weren't great at that time. But still, you got to see other teams, and we got to travel a little bit, so that was fun. Uh, so I did that. I did the CFL, and then in 2010, I got a really good opportunity when TSN acquired the rights for the National Lacrosse League. And, of course, you guys have the Vancouver Warriors out there, and back then they, there was no team. Well, there was a team in Vancouver, and then they weren't there. And so, uh, it's first of all, it's great to see a team out in Vancouver. Uh, that's a great lacrosse community, uh, province, all of it. Um, but we we got to cover some of the Toronto Rock games. So we were basically the Toronto Rock uh, host broadcaster, but we traveled around to different cities in Canada, in the U.S. And so that was a lot of fun. I was the host. I did the sideline reporting. And I worked with uh, Dave Randorf, Brian Shanahan, uh, and so we we I thought we we did really well for a few years, um, and so I enjoyed that immensely. And then uh, I actually got to do some play by play on a few of the games uh, for different reasons, but I enjoyed that too. And I really thought, boy, this is something I could see why the great play-by-play -play people make it seem so easy, but it's a tough job. It is a very tough job, but you have to enjoy it. And uh, I did, and it was it was a different perspective than I had had in the past, but I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, that was just, you know, when you think back, when you're asking me what I was hoping for, I mean, I got a chance to do a lot of things that, you know, a lot of people don't get a chance to do. And also I got a chance to do things that I really initially wasn't considering, but the opportunity came up and I was able to pursue it. And you took my next question from me. I was going to ask you about things that, uh, that you were able to do that you didn't, you didn't initially think about, yeah. uh, but, but, uh, you, you talk about, uh, you talk about special things that you were mm -hmm. able to be a part of. And I want to, I want to take that to some of the encounters and some of the interviews, uh, that you've found yourself conducting. Um, cause, uh, doing, doing a little bit of research, uh, on your, on your resume and the, the athletes that you've come across mm -hmm. and, and, uh, done some interviews with, it's pretty impressive. Um, especially, uh, in your sport of basketball. Yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, when you're in Toronto, there's a good chance you're going to get a lot of the big names coming through for one reason or another, even before the Raptors arrived. Uh, there used to be uh, exhibition games played here in Toronto at the old Maple Leaf Gardens, and then they tried it at, uh, which is now Rogers Centre, the Dome. Um, and so inevitably, just in your line of work, you were going to see uh, some famous athletes, whether it was basketball or any sport. Obviously, everybody knows the Buffalo Bills came up here for a few years to play their Bills in Toronto series. And so that also meant that sometimes Jim Kelly would come up here. And there was one, one day where I'm at the game and Jim Kelly and Dan Marino are both there. And I got to interview both of them. And that was pretty, pretty cool because they're both really good guys. And obviously they were great as quarterbacks. So that was pretty nice. Um, you know, you mentioned the basketball with me. So uh, my, my idol growing up was Julius Irving, Dr. J. And so, you know, he was the guy I looked to. And he, obviously he was pre-Jordan. He was pre-Kobe and pre-LeBron. That's the guy everybody wanted to be was Dr. J. Uh, at least in the era that I grew up in through high school and such. 
And so I would mimic him a little bit in, you know, uh, in games and high school games. And uh, of course I couldn't do what he did, but I, you know, I tried to dunk the ball the same way or try to do different things. So, but he was the guy. So once he retired, he actually came up to Toronto about a year later to be kind of like an ambassador for an event that was going on here. And I, I was just kind of staring at him and I was almost speechless. Like I couldn't even talk to him. Right. It was just, but I did, I said a quick hi and we got a picture taken and it was great. And then the one that really blew me away though, amongst all the interviews I've ever done was interviewing Pele because growing up in South America, Pele was like Gretzky was here in Canada. He was the guy, right? He was the guy. And even though we didn't have a great soccer side in Venezuela, Brazil wasn't that far away. And so you would always see the Brazilian matches uh, and you would just see he was on, if there wasn't a lot of TV, but he was on TV a lot, okay? Yep. So the first time I got to meet him, he came through Toronto to uh, promote the World Cup. And I think that was 1998. And I was, in, like, if I thought I was nervous with Dr. J, it was even more so with Pele. Because, again, he was like my idol, absolute idol. So sitting down and talking to him, I was a nervous wreck. He, uh, you know, I told him I grew up in Venezuela and I watched him. And then so at one point I was so nervous that he basically stopped me and he spoke to me in Spanish. Now, anybody who knows Brazil, they speak Portuguese, but he obviously knew Spanish. So he spoke to me in Spanish a little bit. And I'm telling you, that really settled me down. I don't know what it was. It was just the way he talked to me. And I was able to get through the interview, thankfully. And we had a great interview. It was a lot of fun. And by the way, that's the t that's the day I also found out why Pele, his name is Pele. Because that's not his real name. That's his nickname. And I bet you, you didn't know this, Jonathan, but I'll, I'll let you, for people who don't know, his real name is Edson Arantes Dos Nacimiento. Now, that's a mouthful. But the reason he called himself Pele was that when he was a kid, he would be in the playgrounds with other kids, and he was a bit of a scrappy kid. He'd get into fights a lot. And fight in Spanish or Portuguese, very similar, is Pele, Peliar. That's where he came up with the name. And that name, because other kids would call him that. Because I'd say, hey, Pele, like because he had fought somebody. So apparently, and that was news to me that day. And I was just blown away. And so uh, that was a big coup to find out why he was named Pele. And I don't think it was common knowledge. It really wasn't. So that was kind of fun. And then he came back four years later uh, for the next World Cup. He was coming through town again to promote. And this time, uh, I was a lot more calm. And somebody was good enough to take a picture. Oh, wow. So I was interviewing him, and one of the photogs here from one of the newspapers took a couple of pictures. And then they said, hey, I, I just took a couple of pictures of you interviewing Pelly. Would you like them? And I, I hugged the person. I said, are you kidding? Yes, yes, please. So as you can see, I framed that one. Uh, that was pretty special. But he actually remembered me. And I'm, I'm hoping it's because we ended up having a good interview, not because I was a bit of a, you know, a nervous basket case when we started, but he actually remembered me. And so that was pretty cool. But wow. I was a little bit, you know, that was four years later. I was a little bit more, uh, I guess, mature, uh, a little bit more experienced. So I handled it a lot better. And as you can see, we did it kind of standing up as opposed to the, the first one was a sit down interview where you do the whole back and forth. This one was a little bit more. You know, it was a little quicker, it was back and forth that way, but it was still a lot of fun. And so, yeah, and so over the years, you know, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Patrick Ewing, Wayne Gretzky, like you go through the list of all the sports, all the big names in baseball. Uh, you know, obviously when the Blue Jays won those two World Series here in the early 90s, uh, being around that team with Alomar and Molitor and, uh, you know, uh, just some – just some great guys. And so I've been very fortunate to have been able to interview a lot of people. Now, I will say this. What I always hope for when you meet somebody that you idolize is that they're going to be nice 
right? They're going to be good people, that they're going to be a good interview. Sometimes they don't feel like talking. That's fine. They're human beings. They may be having a bad day, whatever. That's, that's all part of it. The one thing you don't want to see is somebody that becomes nasty or is a totally different person that, than what you expected. So that's happened a couple of times, but not with like the top end people. So the first time I ever interviewed Gretzky, amazing. The guy is, he just, he just knew he got it. He knew exactly how to be a pro. Um, like I said, there were a couple of people I had, you know, bit of a fallout with or a run in with, Hey, it's, it's human nature. Like I said, some days people don't want to talk or they just don't have a lot to say and you move on. Right. But for the most part, I can honestly say that most of the, the great athletes that I've had a chance to talk to were good people. And that that's also, you know, that's something you wish for and you hope for. And so I'm glad it worked out. Uh, that's that's fantastic. All right, we're going to take our first break here. Um, that's a lot of fun talking, uh, talking old stories and talking shop. Um, I want to switch gears after the break uh, and talk about more recent times and uh, talk uh, talk to the aspiring sportscasters a little bit more. So we'll be back on the other side of our first break here on Behind the Mic on ASTV. And again, welcome back to Behind the Mic here on ASTV. Jonathan Hudson visiting this week. Our first of two guests, Claude Fig, is behind the mic with us. Had a great time in our first block talking about his career and the origins of it uh, and some of the, the fun experiences and encounters that Claude has had. And I want to I want to progress the talk a little bit to some more recent times and some stuff that might uh, interest uh, the sportscasting audience here this evening. Um, I want to go to 2016 first um, in your career when you made the jump over to News Talk 1010 uh, to go over to the newscasting side of things. How much of a of a transition was that to go from sports to covering news? Well, it was it was definitely a change. But uh, when I started in my career, I actually started in a newsroom. So I got exposed to the newsroom setting thing early on. My, my first professional job in broadcast was at Global Television here in Toronto. I was behind the scenes. I was an editorial assistant. So I did a lot of different things, but it was news only. Now, we did have a sports arm at Global at the time. There was a show called Sportsline with Jim Taddy, Mark Hebcher, that I eventually ended up working at for nearly two years. But I was in the newsroom for a couple of months. And uh, to me, it was just, uh, you know, it was a gig. And I was also exposed to what the news people do. Uh, so then you go through almost 20 years that I was a sportscaster and then, Unfortunately, a fallout with uh, the company that owned us uh, buying people out. You guys just experienced that in Vancouver a couple of weeks ago. One of your sports radio stations was uh, shut down by their by the company who shall remain nameless because I don't have a lot of good things to say about them right now. Um, but they uh, they're the same people who own uh, stations here in Toronto that, and one of which I was working for. And um, so I found myself on the outside, but I, after that, uh, and that was in 2013, uh, I ended up working with TSN for a couple of years, kind of freelancing, and I got to do a lot of different things, including coming to Prince George for the Canada Winter Games. Uh, and then in 2016, I actually went back to my old uh, station in, in Toronto at uh, CTV, and I was a backup uh, sports anchor, and I was there for about eight months. 
And then uh, again, things kind of kind of abruptly ended uh, because the company decided to uh, start uh, saving a couple of bucks uh, for the shareholders. And um, so about a month or two later, I uh, I approached uh, the radio station that you mentioned and uh, they, I, I didn't think they were going to give me an opportunity just simply because, hey, you know, you're labeled as a sports person your whole career. And all of a sudden now you're going to transition to news. There's a lot of people who have done that, by the way. So it's nothing new. Uh, so I did. And uh, they, they actually gave me an opportunity. The uh, the boss in charge at the time said he knew me and he like he knew my work and he said he, he was a fan and I appreciated that. So I got the opportunity to go there. And yeah, it's not the same talking about, you know, uh, shootings and uh, and certainly in the past year talking about the virus. I mean, it can be draining and I can understand how some news people get burnt out because it's serious. Like we're talking about real stuff that happens every day. You're not talking about why. Connor McDavid hasn't scored in two games against the Leafs and why the Leafs have shut him out two straight times or why the Canucks aren't as good as they're supposed to be this year, right? I mean, that's that's fun stuff to talk about. Even when things aren't going bad in the sports world, you know, when you're talking about a losing streak or somebody not scoring, that doesn't compare to talking about somebody getting shot and why more people are getting infected by this virus and whatever else is going on in the world, right? Politics, whatever you want to talk about. So it was definitely an adjustment. It took me a little time to really sort of feel comfortable talking about it. But as I've told all the students that I've taught the last few years, the approach is still the same. Whatever you're doing in broadcast, whether it's news, whether it's sports, whether it's entertainment, whatever it is, the approach has to be the same. If you're going to succeed, you can't cut corners. I don't cut corners. I've always put all the effort into everything I do. I treat it all the same way. And to me, at the end of the day, it was always about getting to air on time, having the best newscast possible, having all the information that I needed. And it was the same thing when I did a report for sports, uh, whether I worked at TSN, whether I was anchoring sports, you're always the approach always has to be the same. So, yeah. The subject matter was different, but the approach was the same. But it did take a little bit of a, a, a time to adjust. And one thing I'd like to do with you here today uh, before we wrap up is mm -hmm. um, I would like to uh, talk uh, in, in practical terms to kind of personalize for the audience what's been going on um, in the industry of late. Mm -hmm. And you were caught up um, in that. Uh, you're no longer with with uh, your previous station as of the mm -hmm. beginning of February. And not to take it down a negative road, that's not the intent and that's not, not my all. place. But I want to humanize it because mm -hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of talk from from fans that are losing their favorite stations, that are losing mm -hmm. their favorite personalities, that have yep. less access to their teams. But Take that inside somebody who does lose their job in a fashion like that. What is what is that experience like uh, from a human standpoint? And yeah. how much you know? How much interaction w is there um, with others through that? Well, of course, it's uh, it's really a gut punch uh, anytime you're told you're no longer wanted somewhere. Uh, and of course, a lot of it's 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 widely been talked about. So I don't have to get into details about the company that I was previously employed by, who let a lot of good people go right across the country. It wasn't just in Toronto. They they gutted a lot of newsrooms and places right across Canada, and then a day later came out and talked about how much money they had just made in the previous quarter. That obviously did not sit very well with a lot of people. It just showed the kind of class or classless attitude that that company uh, holds and and what they think of their employees. But the fact is, it happened when it happened to me the first time, and that was uh, seven years ago, that really hurt because that was my 20-year career in sportscasting that had just suddenly been sort of knocked out, uh, and I didn't know how long it was going to last and what was going to happen. 
Um, and certainly when you have a family and when you're talking about your career and nobody saw the changes that were coming in broadcast back then that have now arrived as to how every company seems to be cutting back on employees and they seem to be getting away from quality for the sake of saving a few dollars for their shareholders or anything like that. I mean, let's face it, it's not the same playing field that we grew up with and that we came to play in when we started our careers. And you can ask that about a lot of people in the oh, industry. Is breaking up there. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, are you hear- off there. No, are you hearing me now? We're okay now. Uh, we're getting better. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just move on to the next. I'll just move on to the next question. Sorry about that. Okay. And uh, we should be good to go. Um, but you, you brought up in your last answer um, that, you know, aspiring sportscasters might be looking at the changes and a lot of the downsizing and the instability that there appears to be right now. And I guess that's the that's the only other major thing that I would be curious about um, with, you know, how you would talk to, to aspiring sportscasters who are looking at what's going on right now. And what, what, uh, what outlook uh, would you give to them to, to encourage them in their pursuit? Uh, you, you're hearing me okay now. I just want to check that the audio is good. Yep. Okay, great. Yep, so you're good. So what I tell my students or anybody who's asked me is, first of all, you got to stay positive. You, you can't let all this other stuff go and, and, and beat you up and, and sort of kill some of the momentum and some of the enthusiasm that you have. If you want to pursue this, you have to try. You have to try to stay positive, and even though they're seeing how things are changing, but the one thing I like about the students that I've had the last four years is that they seem to be fairly resilient. And what they're going to do, they're not just sort of locked into one thing. They're very amenable to, you know, sort of trying different things to try to find their foot in the door. And so we've always tried to help them in any way we can. But I think the main thing is, if you really believe in your heart that this is what you want to do, you're going to keep at it, right? No matter what you're pursuing, whatever whatever career you're pursuing, if you're passionate about it and you believe that's what you want to do, you're going to find a way to try to make it work. Now, some people last longer than others. Some people have given up earlier than others. And that's a personal decision. But, you know, there's a lot of writing gigs available. There's still a, there's a lot of people starting their own podcasts. There's different ways that people are trying to get their foot in the door. And I, and I commend them for that because it is it has gotten a lot tougher. The industry has shrunk. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the jobs just aren't there like they used to be. And so you have to be creative. And you also have to be willing to try different things to try and find your, you know, find your way. I did the same thing in my era. I found a different way to get in. I couldn't get in on air. So I got in behind the scenes and sort of worked my way up that way. Nowadays, like I said, you have the digital aspect, like the shows that you're doing and uh, other people are trying to do podcasts, writing. Those are all ways that you try to get your, your, yourself uh, some attention and hopefully at some point that can you can parlay that into an actual you know full-time position somewhere it is a challenge but again the people who really want it like anything they're the ones that are driven and motivated and passionate they're the ones that are going to succeed absolutely and further evidence of what you uh what you talk about there is um out here on the west coast uh rob fay has pivoted into uh, an online streaming show that mm-hmm. is absolutely taking off uh, in Vancouver right now is it, it's pretty much taken over as the primary Canucks post game show. Uh, so he's done a fantastic job for himself. And just before we went on air, I saw news that uh, Brent Wallace in Ottawa has teamed up for a podcast with Mark Mathalot. Yeah. Um, so I know those two will crush that. So as you mentioned, it's there. There, there's going to be challenges in anything you do, uh, but it's pivoting and it's creativity to make it work. 
So uh, there, there's no doubt about that. And I actually spoke to Brent yesterday when I heard that he was going to be doing something and he told me he was doing this podcast. Uh, and so I'm happy for Brent because he was a long time employee at TSN and uh, like all the people that got let go in the last month or so, it's been a shock. Like in my newsroom, they let everybody go except for one person. And so th that's a lot of people's lives to get affected. And so there is the human aspect of this, that it's great to be in broadcast and you really have to want it. And you can, you know, you can try to do the best job you can, but nothing's ever guaranteed, I guess. And so no matter how talented you are, we've, as we've seen across Canada, a lot of talented, good people were shown the door. Uh, and so that's, that's the crux of it. You have to weigh whether you want to put up with the heartache. And I put up with a lot of heartache before I got my real big chance. So, uh, again, it comes down to passion. It comes down to um, willingness to want to, you know, continue and want to pursue it. And ultimately, though, if you're good, you're going to find a way to make it work. Absolutely. Well, I, I wish we had more time, but uh, <laughs> we do need to – we do need to take our second break here um but claude uh thank you so much for uh answering the phone when we came ringing for you and uh for the chat today a lot of a lot of fun uh learned a lot um so thanks for thanks for your time no problem jonathan anytime uh happy to oblige and uh yeah you can uh, hit me up anytime i'm happy to talk sports because hey that's the passion, right? We all have that passion for sports and we can talk about, and broadcast. So anytime um, I'm here for you. Absolutely. Appreciate it. All right. We'll take one more break here on behind the mic on ASTV and we'll be back on the other side with ASTV host, John Easthope, as we talk about the Western Hockey League and what he has coming out on the Double Digit Hockey Podcast. And once again, a welcome back to Behind the Mic on ASTV. Jonathan Hudson back with you. Just finished up a conversation with Claude Fagg, a longtime TSN and CTV sportscaster. And he's now an instructor uh, in, in college, in Seneca College, where he once went to school. Uh, great time talking with him about memories and uh, words of wisdom he would pass along to to the aspiring sportscasters and also a little bit of little bit of real talk uh, with a with a positive intent about the current state um, of the sportscasting industry so for our final block here today I'm thrilled to bring on our second guest for this week's show it's my colleague and friend from the Double Digit Hockey Show here on ASTV, it's John Eastope. John, thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure to join you. Thanks for having me. And before we dive into what you and I are going to talk about here today, of course, uh, the WHL is starting up. We want to get into that a little bit, and then we want to learn about your show. But uh, you were backstage for a little bit while we talked to Claude, and I wanted to see if anything caught your attention uh, uh, from what you heard Claude say here this evening. Yeah, I really like Claude and the work that he does. I, I enjoyed his Pele story. And I also enjoyed the the uh, encouragement he was giving to aspiring broadcasters. I put myself in that category as well, that uh, still learning the tricks of the trade and the 
ins and outs of the business. And so I appreciate the words that he gave and the encouragement he gave to those that he's teaching and the way that he goes about presenting himself is always class as well. I enjoy his work and I do remember him on the sidelines of CFL games as well. So it's good to hear from Claude. It's good to see him on the show. Uh, that was fun for sure. Um, and uh, well, let, let's first talk about uh, double digit hockey uh, before we get into the Western Hockey League. Because that's a good uh, good segue from having Claude on to talking about the guest list that uh, you've had at Double Digit Hockey in your first few weeks since joining the network. Uh, you've had you've had a couple of heavy hitter interviews yourself. What have what's been some of your your favorites uh, so far on on Double Digit? Yeah, I've uh, I took the motto of uh, shoot your shot, and so I I reached out on social media and through some uh, PR departments to to shoot my shot sort of sense, and I was able to get guys like Chris Cufford on. Um, I've had uh, Rob Peterson's coming on this week on my show as well. Um, I really enjoyed a chat I had before I joined ASTV. I had Peter Lombardius on my show. Really enjoyed that one. I've had a lot of the guys from the Calgary area and the sports station there, the Fan 960. Uh, those are the guys that I listen to a lot on the radio. So those are the guys that I've encouraged. So really enjoyed those interviews as well. Um, I've had former NHLer Matt Stachin on the show that was really cool to reach out and see kind of a different point of view on sports and hockey. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been a good, good guest list so far. I think the, my favorite one of all, it was my shortest one of all, but my favorite one of all, I think would be Adnan Burke. He jumped on with me on just my, my YouTube channel there for, we had about 10 minutes that he stretched to 15 for me and uh, really good, really good to chat with him about a few things. So yeah, a couple of good interviews there. Uh, it's been fun been fun to watch uh the watch your show grow over the weeks i've been a fan of yours since day one and had the honor of coming on with you uh to talk a little bit of world juniors a couple of months ago uh so we're glad to finally get you on behind the mic for the return trip yeah i know i do remember that interview that was uh, one of uh, my favorites uh you came on right after peter lombardi's so it was big shoes to fill, uh, but it was fun, fun to be having you on my show, and I'm glad to be on yours now. So, yeah, there's no filling the shoes of Lou. There, <laughs> there there's nobody that's going to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, before we jump, one more thing before we jump <laughs> into the dub, um, I just wanted to uh, premise the WHL talk with uh, a little bit of your your background and your experience. Uh, covering the Western Hockey League, as I know that's a that's a major component of your show. Yeah, um, so it started back when Double Digit Hockey was just a blog of mine. Uh, I did some self articles, just wrote them out, put them up on social media for myself, uh, and then I caught the eye of the guys at Dub Network. Uh, Dub Network is a WHL website. They focus on the league and get all the stories going. So Paul Figler created that website. And we got to talking and he uh, he'd asked if I'd write on the left hurricanes for them. So took a, took a process to get myself into writing articles for an actual website. But I really enjoyed doing that. I did that for uh, two years. I uh, did that for them. Uh, then I was able to do a small bit of writing for the hockey writers for a while there as well. The pandemic kind of crushed that dream a little bit. But uh, all of that allowed me to get into the WHL a little bit more than I was and present things on my podcast that allowed me to talk more about the league. So I really enjoyed my time writing for uh, dubnetwork.com, uh, uh, and really enjoyed bringing that to my podcast. And so I've actually had Paul on my show uh, at one point, and we were able to talk about that as well. So yeah, Western Hockey League is big for me. So. And your specialty, of course, as we can see over your shoulder, is the Lethbridge Hurricanes. And we'll start there. The WHL uh, having a bit of a bit of a staggered start to uh, their 2020-21 season with the different uh, health territories get, giving their approvals at different times. Uh, but they're getting closer to everybody being on the ice and we'll start in Alberta as they're the first ones out of the gate uh, with games on the board. What's been going on in Alberta as far as WHL action is concerned? 
Well, there's only, uh, only the four, they have five teams in Alberta, so only four have gotten underway. The Hitmen will get theirs going uh, starting March the 5th. Uh, but uh, home and home for the Love Hurricanes was against the Edmonton Oil Kings. It didn't go so well for my side of things. Uh, the Oil Kings showed their class. They should be the class of the Central Division or Alberta Division. Um, this season in the WHL, they're my pick to win the division. They beat the Hurricanes 7-1 and 7-2. So it wasn't a good weekend for the Hurricanes offensively or defensively, but they're still learning with uh, with no Dylan Cousins or Kalen Addison coming back to save the group, so to speak. Uh, they're relying on some younger kids coming into the lineup. So a big learning curve the first weekend for the Hurricanes. Uh, but they have... They have a bright future ahead of them. Uh, a little bit younger of a team this season. Uh, was hoping to get Cousins back, but he lit up Buffalo too much to, to come back. But it's good on him for taking the next steps. Not so good for the Leopard Hurricanes. Uh, but the Oil Kings just seem to be a team that have that structure with them. Uh, they come to play every night, and they have a depth at every position. So they're a really good hockey team there. Uh, the other matchup saw the Medicine Hat Tigers play the Red Deer Rebels and things didn't go so well for the Sutter side of things. They had a nice lead, the Red Deer Rebels 4-1 to one in the first game, but Messonet came back to win that first game. And then on Bob Ridley night, the Messonet Tigers weren't going to be denied and they took uh, they took Red Deer to the woodshed, so to speak, and, and took over that game. So it was a good start for the Western Hockey League. Nice to see a couple of teams all flexing their muscles early here in the season. Yeah, we were talking about uh, off the top of this interview, we we're talking about the different uh, big timer sportscasters that we've had uh, the pleasure of talking to on our shows and uh, somebody that I've crossed paths with a couple of times uh, in the WHL in other, uh, other avenues is uh, Mr. Ridley. And I feel like, uh, um, feel like with him that's the only way to that's the only way to refer to 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 him is uh mr ridley with the the crew he's put together Absolutely. uh you mentioned bob ridley knight that was his four thousandth career game in the whl as a play-by-play -play man all for the medicine at tigers um there i don't know if there's any putting that into perspective but uh just your reflections on on Mr. Ridley and what he has been able to to accomplish with the Tigers. Yeah, it's four thousand games. It seems to be uh, quite the long career for him. Uh, being a Leftbridge guy, I didn't really like the Medicine Hat Tigers growing up, but I still managed to listen to a few of his calls. He he does a very good very good job of calling the Medicine Hat Tigers games. Right, so the big rivalry, the Highway Three rivalry between the two teams. Um, unbelievable. You can't, uh, it's hard pressed for me to find a better broadcaster in the WHL. Uh, and to be able to do it for so long is, it's amazing. And how every broadcast seems to be better than the last. He's so professional about it. Uh, the, my favorite thing about Bob or Mr. Ridley is the fact that he used to drive the bus as well. It's called the games for medicine hat. And it's just unbelievable. The things that he does for that city, he bleeds the tigers and, uh, it's good on him and congratulations. That's Awesome, and I like that the Western Hockey League has now named an award after him for a broadcaster of the year type award. So that's pretty cool accomplishment for him. So congratulations to him. Absolutely, and a perfect gentleman as well. Uh, I so congrats on once again to. I uh, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, so uh, continuing our tour around the Western Hockey League, uh, big news. Uh, around my parts, uh, BC finally gets approval from authorities to start their season. They're going to start up uh, on the 26th of March, playing the same 24-game season, but theirs, with time constraints, is going to be compressed into 40 days every other day in junior hockey. That's a, that's a busy one, um, but they're, they're doing what they have to do. Uh, to get uh, to get a slate of games in the, for these players, for uh, for these players in the in the dub, and there there's players in all different situations and uh, you know prospect status and age status. Uh, but what does it mean to these players to get at least a limited slate of games under the 
under their belt this season. Yeah, that's huge for these players. There's a couple of different levels to this. You've got your 20-year-olds, your overagers, who are going to have a chance to finish out their careers. Not a lot of them are going to move on to professional ranks. So this is where a lot of them end their hockey careers, so to speak. So it's good that they'll have that way of going out. You know, it's a shame there won't be any fans to send them off like we normally do in the WHL. Uh, the final game of the home game of the regular season, you usually give them a nice salute and a send-off. But it's nice that they're going to get a chance to to play out their careers rather than just have them end forcefully by Mother Nature. So it's nice to see that. It's also really good for these uh, players trying to develop their skills who are draft eligible for the NHL, a chance to put out a little bit more of what they can do on the ice so these scouts don't overlook them, so to speak. Uh, it would be nice for them to get back on the ice and be able to groom those skills. And you've got another group in between those two groups of guys that maybe have already been drafted or working towards an NHL contract. So these games will be huge for all of those age groups. Uh, we see a lot of the younger kids being sent back to younger other leagues. So not a chance for a lot of the younger kids, but we've got a lot of kids trying to make a name for themselves still. And so it's good to have them back on the ice. And it's nice to get that news from BC that they're they're going to be up and going here. So they're going to have a little bit harder of a time than people in Alberta because we're only playing on the weekends here. Uh, so it'll be good. But any any games are better than no games. And it'll be good for all those players to get back on the ice and show their skills. And uh, the, the other two divisions we haven't mentioned yet. Saskatchewan, they're operating um, out of Regina this season. They start up on March 19th. And the U.S. division starts up later this month as well with the, diff with the one difference down there uh, being that the Portland, uh, the Portland Winterhawks are operating out of Seattle uh, at least for the start um, of their schedule. Um, and last question for you before uh, we let you go and we wrap up another week here on Behind the Mic. Uh, John, uh, we talked earlier about um, the interviews you've already had with Chris Cuthbert, Adnan Virk, uh, and we, you mentioned Rod Peterson, friend of both of ours, coming on uh, this week. What else, uh, what are you looking to do with double-digit hockey as time goes on, and what uh, what do viewers have to look forward to? Uh, yeah, like you said, Rod Peterson coming on this week on the show, looking to just continue to bring on uh, broadcasters and radio personnel to keep continuing to tell the story around the hockey world. Uh, I could take the show as far as I can, and whether that means ASTV for life or if I get hit big time, you know, Everything, everything's on the table for me right now. But for coming up on the show, we're just going to keep rolling out some good broadcasters and, and try to get some athletes on as well. Sounds great. And before I let you go, where can people, uh, where can people find you, and where can where and when uh, can people find Double Digit Hockey? Double Digit Hockey airs on ASTV every Thursday at seven PM. That's Mountain Time. Uh, you can find it there. I'll always have links tweeted out as well as ASTV will tweet them out. You can find me on Twitter at vintage Johnny 84 and my podcast also has a Twitter page. It's at double digit H K O Y for hockey. Uh, find me there, hit me up there and I'm always free to chat hockey. If you guys are wanting to have a good chat. Sounds great. We encourage everybody to uh, hop on there, interact with you and of course catch the show. John, thanks so much for doing this. I know we've been trying for a while to to connect on this show, and we finally made it work. So thanks so much for coming on. I uh, appreciate your insights on, on your show and on the WHL, and uh, look forward to talking more in, th in the future. Thanks for having me. appreciate it. Thanks, John. We'll take one more break, and we'll be right back here on Behind the Mic with the wrap up and we will call it a night for another week on behind the mic so on the other side of this break we'll wrap it up here on ASTV perfect that was that was as clear as you've been in a while so okay, i think we good. i think we salvaged that last question uh, yeah you're going to have to maybe adjust where my internet stuff is so yeah it there might have been something on my end 
but there is nothing I could I could find. Like the yep. I had an issue with with Claude. Like I said, that one answer of his that got really grainy. Yep. Um, but it cleared up after we gave it a minute. Um, and that wasn't really your issue until until at the end there, kind of. Uh, your issue was your audio and your video was just severely off kilter. Um, so there were two different issues. Um, but I, I don't know. I'll, I'll troubleshoot more um, after and see if there's anything I can do on my end in the future. But Yeah, I'm going to uh, try my end too because that's two interviews I've done this week that have had the same issue. So. Yeah, but... I appreciate you coming on. That was that was fun. Uh, yeah. A little little bit rushed, but uh, no, <laughs> it was fun. Appreciate it. Always uh, always happy to try to give you some give you some love. Thanks. I appreciate it. I, I enjoyed being on as well. So hopefully this is uh, was good for your show as well as mine. So uh, it was it was great. So I'll uh, I'll let you get on with your night. But yep. uh, thanks thanks again. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. All right, we'll see ya. Talk to you later. And one final time, welcome back to Behind the Mic on ESTV. Just wrapping up now from another week. A great episode this week. First with Claude Fay. From formerly of TSN and CTV and wrapping it up just a moment ago on the other side of that last break with John Easthope from Double J Digit Hockey on ASTV. Our thanks again to both of our both of our guests. Had a lot of fun and hopefully you did as well. And if you missed any part of our show here this evening, um, or you want to go back and watch our previous episodes, you can find our archive playlist on YouTube that has every episode with featuring past guests like Jimmy Thomas, Barry Davis, Kelsey Braid. Today's will be up there momentarily and a bunch of others. So that's where you can find our show as well as the archive playlist for all shows here across the ASTV network. We'll be back again same time, same place next week, 5 Pacific, 8 Eastern on ASTVproductions.com, YouTube, and Facebook with another conversation with another great sportscaster. Very excited about what uh, we're lining up for next week and in the coming weeks, so we hope you'll stay along with us for the ride. So once again, thanks to Claude Feig and to John Easthope for this week's chat. And we will catch up with you again next Friday night. Good night. <laughs>